If all you know about React is that it came from Mr. Zuck's meta empire, that its logo is some arbitrary blue atomic symbol used for single page dynamic web apps, then congrats. <laughs> You know more than I did a few decades ago, back when I was in the pre-production environment as a fetus. And if you're a React noob who uses the use effect hook for literally, literally everything, including data fetching, then you should probably look up React Query, buddy. There is a reason the docs have a page called You Might Not Need an Effect. But in either case, you're in the right place. In this video, I'm going to give you a gentle introduction to React and explain its core features. Component-based architecture, the virtual DOM, JSX, declarative programming, context, and the hooks you actually need. So buckle up and let's get started. What is React and why does it exist? React is a JavaScript library for building user interfaces originally created at Facebook in 2013 to address the growing complexity of large, stateful web applications. At the time, UI code was dominated by imperative DOM manipulation. I'm talking about you, jQuery. Tangled event handlers and implicit data flow, which made systems brittle and hard to reason about as they grew. React's central contribution was not performance or syntax, but a programming model. By treating the UI as a function of state and enforcing a clear separation between rendering and side effects, React made UI code predictable, testable, and scalable. Over time, this model proved flexible enough to support web, native mobile via React Native, concurrent rendering, and server-driven UI, all while preserving the same conceptual foundation. At its foundation, React is built on a single powerful idea. The user interface is a deterministic function of application state. Instead of writing imperative code that says, find this DOM node and update its text when X happens, you describe what the UI should look like for a given state, and React ensures the real DOM matches that description. Now let's talk about components. A React component is not a template, class, or widget in the traditional sense. A component is an executable function, and it returns a description of UI. The greeting function, written in JSX, is a blueprint for a React component that returns a React element. When React renders this component, it calls the function. The return value is not the DOM. It is a React element, a lightweight JavaScript object describing what the UI should be, i.e. a virtual DOM node. React then uses React DOM to efficiently render it into the browser's actual DOM. If the component renders again, the function is simply called again with new inputs. This has several important consequences. First, components are easy to reason about because they behave like normal functions. Second, UI becomes naturally composable. Complex interfaces are built by combining smaller components, just like functions calling other functions. Finally, rendering becomes cheap because nothing is mutated during render. React is just building descriptions. Now let's look at JSX. JSX often looks like HTML, but it is crucial to understand that JSX is just syntactic sugar for JavaScript. It works by compiling JSX into vanilla JavaScript react.create element calls via a transpilation tool like Babel. This is needed because web browsers do not understand JSX natively. Of course, other tools are used in transpilation like ESBuild as a bundler and transpiler for build tools like Vite or SWC and Next.js. Note that we could write plain JavaScript using create element calls, but it's a lot more complex. Then the React DOM renderer renders that output into the actual DOM, i.e. your HTML file. This JSX is transpiled into this JavaScript code. JSX exists purely to make deeply nested UI structures readable and writable. It does not introduce a new runtime or templating engine. Because JSX is effectively JavaScript, you can embed expressions directly inside it, which makes dynamic UI UI trivial to express. Importantly, JSX does not create DOM nodes. It creates React elements, which are immutable descriptions used later during reconciliation, which I'll touch on shortly. Now let's talk about React elements and the virtual DOM. Every render in React produces a tree of React elements. This tree is commonly referred to as the virtual DOM, though that term can be a bit misleading. The virtual DOM is not a mirror of the real DOM. It is a model of the UI expressed as plain JavaScript objects. When state changes, React performs the following steps. It reruns component functions to produce a new element tree or virtual DOM. It compares the new tree to the previous one, and then it determines the minimal set of changes and applies only those changes to the real DOM. The diffing mechanism between the new virtual DOM tree and the previous snapshot is known as reconciliation. It determines what modifications are required to the existing DOM. React employs a renderer library like React DOM after the reconciliation process, which uses 
uses the updated app information to update the rendered app. This module guarantees that the changed node or nodes are the only ones sent to and painted by the actual DOM. Creating and diffing JavaScript objects is far cheaper than manipulating the DOM directly. React embraces re-rendering aggressively and optimizes only the final DOM updates. Now let's talk a little bit about state. This is the persistent data that drives rendering. State is how React remembers information across renders. Unlike local variables, state persists between function calls and triggers re-rendering when updated. Remember, a re-render in React is the process where React re-executes a component's function to create a new snapshot of the UI it should display based on the latest data. Here, each time set count is called, React schedules a new render. On that render, the counter function runs again. But this time, React supplies the updated state value. Nothing is mutated directly. Instead, React replaces the old render with a new one. This explains why React state updates are asynchronous and batched. State updates are requests to re-render, not immediate assignments. Quick pause. Speaking of how we render components, there is a fundamental flaw in how we usually build them. The majority of software is built around a one-size-fits-all mental model. That is exactly what today's sponsor, Tambo AI, is solving. Tambo is a generative UI SDK for React that lets you break out of that rigid structure. The concept is simple but elegant. Instead of hard coding every path, you register your existing React components and the AI decides which ones to render based on the user's intent. This means users don't have to learn your app your app adapts to them. Tambo enables AI models to dynamically generate and render interactive React components like forms, charts, or dashboards within a conversation. This means users can make requests in natural language and the application's interface changes in real time to meet those requests. It abstracts away the complexity of connecting a large language model to a UI, offering features like automatic message history and state management through dedicated hooks. This allows development teams to prototype and iterate faster. Instead of forcing users to learn complex, rigid interfaces, the application adapts to the user's needs conversationally. The framework is open source and compatible with all major React platforms, Next.js, Vite, etc., and various LLM providers such as OpenAI, Google, Anthropic, etc., giving developers flexibility in their tech stack. If you want to stop building static, one-size-fits-all software and start shipping generative UI, check out Tambo AI in the description down below. Thank you very much to Tambo for sponsoring this video. Now back to even more React. Now let's talk about the somewhat critical distinction between rendering versus committing. One of the most important ideas for deep React understanding is that rendering does not update the DOM. Rendering is the phase where React calls your components and builds the element tree, also known as the virtual DOM. The DOM is updated later during the commit phase. Because rendering may happen multiple times and may even be aborted in modern React, it must be pure. Rendering must not fetch data, modify the DOM, register event listeners, or start timers. Render functions should do one thing only, describe the UI. Rendering is calculating what to show, creating a virtual DOM tree from components, while committing is the phase of actually applying those calculated changes to the browser's actual DOM, making them visible to the user. The TLDR is that rendering is the preparation, it's pure, fast, and interruptible, and committing is the execution, updating the real DOM and running effects. Now let's touch on hooks and lifecycle. Originally, React used class components to manage lifecycle and state. Modern React replaces this with hooks, which allow function components to participate fully in React's lifecycle while preserving the functional programming model. Hooks are not magic APIs. They are a way for React to associate persistent state and effects with a specific position in the component's execution. Here, useState gives the component memory, and useEffect ties side effects to the component's lifecycle. The effect runs after the component is committed to the DOM, and the cleanup runs before the effect is rerun or the component is removed. Conceptually, hooks map cleanly to lifecycle phases. Rendering, the component function executes. Commit, DOM updates are applied. Effects, external systems are synchronized. And cleanup, subscriptions and resources are released. The rule that hooks must be called unconditionally and in the same order exists because React identifies hook state by call order, not by name. This design keeps the runtime simple and predictable. So hooks unify state, lifecycle, and composition into a single coherent abstraction. Any interaction with the external world belongs in an effect. So effects run after React commits changes to the DOM. They allow components to synchronize with systems that React does not control, such as network APIs, browser APIs, or subscriptions. The dependency array defines when the effect should rerun. Conceptually, effects let React maintain a clean separation between pure rendering and impure side effects, which is essential for correctness and concurrency. Now let's discuss props and one-way data flow. Props are how components receive input from their parent. 
props are immutable for a given render. A component cannot modify its props, and it cannot directly change a parent's state. This enforces one-way data flow, which makes data movement explicit and predictable. When state needs to be shared, it is lifted to the nearest common ancestor. This design choice is intentional. Let's talk about lists, keys, and identity. When rendering lists, React must track which element corresponds to which piece of data across renders. Keys are not about performance alone, they define identity. Without stable keys, React cannot reliably preserve component state or apply minimal updates. Keys tell React this element represents the same conceptual thing as before. And one of my favorite topics, context. Context primarily exists to solve a very specific structural problem in React applications, prop drilling. Prop drilling occurs when a value is needed deep in the component tree, but must be passed through many intermediate components that do not actually use it. These intermediate components become mechanically coupled to data they conceptually do not care about, increasing fragility and cognitive load. Context allows React to bypass this by letting components declare what data they depend on, rather than how that data is threaded through the tree. A provider establishes a value at some level in the hierarchy, and any descendant component can consume it directly, regardless of how deeply nested it is. Conceptually, context behaves like a lexically scoped global state, but with important constraints. It is scoped to a subtree, participates in React's render cycle, and respects unidirectional data flow. When a context value changes, React schedules re-renders only for components that consume that context, not for the entire subtree. However, context is intentionally not optimized for high frequency updates. Because context changes can trigger many re-renders, it is best suited for stable, low churn values such as themes, localization, authentication state, feature flags, or environment configuration. Using context as a general purpose state store often leads to unnecessary renders and tightly coupled components. A useful mental model is something like this. Props define explicit data flow, while context defines ambient dependencies. Props make relationships visible and traceable, while context trades some explicitness for structural simplicity. I would argue that well-designed React systems use both deliberately rather than treating context as a pure replacement for props. Modern React can pause, resume, and discard renders. This is only possible because rendering is pure and side effect free. React can safely interrupt work without leaving the UI in an inconsistent state. Concurrency allows React to prioritize urgent updates, keep interfaces responsive, and prepare future UI states without blocking the main thread. Everything in React becomes simpler once you internalize this. Rendering is just computation. State changes trigger recomputation, and React decides how and when to update the DOM. Components are functions. JSX is syntactic sugar. The virtual DOM is an optimization detail. Effects exist to handle impurity. If you want to learn more about React, Go, C++, Rust, and low-level systems concepts, be sure to check out my newsletter down below. And if you want to learn how to build Docker, Redis, and compilers from scratch, get 40% off CodeCrafters using the link in the description. They are hands down the best project-based coding platform out there. As always, thank you very much for watching, and happy coding.